tonight, Prince Harry, Meghan, and a car chase controversy. Pursued by the paparazzi on the streets of New York City. They seem pretty nervous. All of a sudden, paparazzi came out of nowhere and started taking pictures. Why the Duke and Duchess call it near catastrophic. The dangerous wildfire smoke now choking Western Canada and beyond. I have asthma, so it's been quite difficult. I've been coughing a lot. And the Titanic, like you have never seen it before, adding a new dimension to the world's most famous shipwreck. To see it without the water was just breathtaking. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, a very public battle between Prince Harry and the paparazzi appears to be heating up again after an incident last night in New York. So it happened after the Duke and Duchess left an event in Manhattan. Harry, Meghan, and Meghan's mother were involved in what their spokesperson called a, quote, near catastrophic car chase, reportedly lasting more than two hours. So that initial description, of course, reminiscent of another chase by the paparazzi 25 years ago that ended with the death of Harry's mother, Princess Diana. But as Chris Reyes tells us, the full picture may be more complicated. The night started with the cameras keeping their distance as Prince Harry and Meghan attended a gala in New York where the Duchess was being honored. But soon after the event, the couple's publicist said their ride home turned into a near catastrophic car chase at the hands of highly aggressive paparazzi. Those words, a chilling echo of the 1997 crash that killed Harry's mother, Princess Diana, in Paris. In a statement, a spokesperson for the couple said this relentless pursuit lasting over two hours resulted in multiple near collisions involving other drivers on the road, pedestrians and two NYPD officers. According to reports, Harry, Meghan, and her mom traveled all over Manhattan in their own vehicle, trying to avoid the cameras, and eventually waited at a police station before jumping into a random taxi. The whole pursuit full of security questions, according to a former protection officer for the royal family. Why is it taking two hours? It certainly should have been part of that team's uh, contingencies to go to a place of safety. This video from TMZ shows Prince Harry, Meghan, and her mother, Doria Raglan, in the back of a cab. The driver said the ride was not high speed or dangerous, but the photographers were relentless. Here's what he told CBC News. And there was paparazzi cars following us, but they kept their distance. It wasn't, you know, they weren't right on top of us or trying to come to the side and stuff like that. New York police confirmed the incident, calling it challenging adding that no arrests were made, nor reports of injuries or collisions, and all three arrived at their destination. If there's a discrepancy in Harry's account of what happened and everyone else's, one royal watcher points to the prince's traumatic experience with the press to explain it. It's not only a memory of his, the death of his mother, but also his own personal memories, one of being chased as a small child, photos of him as a small child, and this is you know, incredibly wounding, incredibly triggering. So Chris, we've heard a few different characterizations of what happened. You're where it all started last night. A chase like this is unusual for New York, no? Yeah, unusual for a couple of reasons. One, celebrities are here all the time. They're certainly photographed, but not common that they're chased. It's also hard to imagine any kind of prolonged car chase in the city because of congestion. Harry and Meghan would have had to leave from this venue behind me in Midtown, and if it took them a long time to get anywhere, traffic could have been a factor. New York City's mayor said it's hard for him to believe that this was a two-hour high-speed chase. He still acknowledged what happened, called it reckless and irresponsible on the part of photographers. All right, Chris Reyes in New York. Thank you. Harry and Meghan now live in the U.S. after saying they needed to escape the harassment of the British tabloid press. Thomas Dagla takes a look at their complicated and tumultuous relationship with the paparazzi. Compare front pages of the British tabloids now to those in the 90s. The royals still capture the spotlight, but those pictures nowadays are often stage managed by the palace. Hardly the work of the lawless paparazzi whom Diana's sons blamed for her death. This former tabloid editor says for years, British papers have agreed to seek royal approval to publish risky pictures. 
was there a pursuit in order to get the photograph? Was there abuse in order to get the photograph? And did the royal in question have a reasonable expectation of privacy? It all changed for Prince Harry and Meghan when they moved to the U.S., where there's no such deal and celebrity culture reigns. We have that pap on the scooter again? Yes, ma'am. Pursued through the streets of New York a year and a half ago, the couple shared this moment in their Netflix docuseries, eerily similar to what they now say they endured for two straight hours. She's following us. Hey. This path will be worst case scenario, so safety yeah. first. Worst case scenario, we're going from one garage to another. This was something that I thought was confined to the past, but clearly not. Diana's crash in that Paris tunnel forever shaped the way her sons would approach the press. William won court battles against a French magazine for publishing photos of Catherine sunbathing topless. Harry is now pursuing three separate legal cases targeting British papers for breaching his privacy. Okay, where did he go? And self-described L.A. paparazzo Rick Mendoza has seen prices driven down by cell phone cameras. Everyone is now a paparazzo because everyone's taking photographs now. But no, they have to have a scapegoat. The car chase has landed Harry and Meghan on front pages again. All of these pictures taken with their consent. Thomas Dagg of CBC News, Toronto. Still in New York, a conviction tonight in connection with a limo crash that killed 20 people back in 2018. 17 passengers, the driver and two bystanders were killed after the vehicle's brakes failed. The limo service owner was convicted today of 20 counts of manslaughter. He faces up to 15 years in prison. Sentencing is set for later this month. And prosecutors argued he failed to conduct routine inspections. Turning now to the wildfire emergency in Alberta, a stark admission from officials tonight. This already intense wildfire season could continue through the summer. This is going to be a marathon. It's going to be a while for us to maintain uh, this situation. For Alberta, this is unprecedented in many ways. Along with the fires, there's a secondary hazard. Heavy smoke has now moved south, covering several cities, including Calgary, and borders are no match for these evolving conditions. From B.C. in the west all the way to Quebec in the east, smoke has now moved across much of the country, but the worst conditions remain in western Canada, the epicenter, where the air quality has reached the highest risk level on the scale in multiple cities. That is where Sam Sampson begins tonight as she looks at how Alberta's wildfires could affect Canadians thousands of kilometres away. The roads clear of congestion, but the air another story. I have asthma, so it's been quite difficult. I've been coughing a lot. This is the, actually the first year that it's bothered me. It's very unhealthy to be outside. This machine and those who run it measure air quality near Calgary. As the smoke blows in from nearby wildfires, it records high levels of danger. What's in the air impacts all of us. You breathe in the air every day. I always say you can go, what, about two weeks without food, about two days without water. How long can you go without air? The situation now, a continuation of a trend from last year, when Calgary was blanketed by smoke for more than 500 hours. The average over the last three decades, 15. Though the fires remain mostly in western and northern Canada, air quality statements bleed outwards as the smoke travels away from the source to the lungs of other Canadians. Calgary and Edmonton recorded air quality health indexes of 10 plus Wednesday, indicating a very high health risk, as did Regina, Saskatoon, and even with rain, so did Winnipeg. The smoke is dangerous for the very young, the very old, and those with health issues. This could cause long-term concerns for healthy lungs, too. Our concern is that this could, could happen all summer long. We are basically doing something like exposing ourselves to something similar to cigarette smoke all day long, every day, with no break. The risk is so high, Edmonton launched its first extreme weather response to poor air quality. All city buildings are open for people who need a break from the outside, and anyone can get an N95 mask, because what's in the air should be taken seriously. In highly susceptible individuals, even 10-minute exposure to poor air can cause heart attacks. So there is tremendous individual vari variations. Right now, smoke from Canadian wildfires travels to the west coast, as far south as Oklahoma, and out east here to Toronto, forcing everyone in its wake to think about something 
many of us don't think about at all. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Toronto. As that smoke spreads, the importance of keeping as many fires contained as possible is increasingly urgent. And part of that effort is being led by Indigenous firefighters, including right there in Entwistle, Alberta, a small community about 100 kilometres west of Edmonton. The region, like so many others, is under constant threat. But tonight, Julia Wong takes us inside the fight to keep residents there safe. This is critical work to extinguish an Alberta wildfire. But for Indigenous firefighters like Noah Paul, it's one of many ways to protect their communities. Knowing the land, like, especially for the communities that are around it, like First Nations communities, they can, you know, tell elders if there's still resources out there like medicine, cultural use areas, hunting grounds especially. At one point, this same fire in Parkland County forced hundreds of people to flee their homes. The threat, now less severe and residents can return, but numerous crews remain on the front lines, including firefighters from nearby bands, digging up hot spots and flooding them with water. Hot spots we will be working on is this uh, cluster. This veteran firefighter, originally from Fort McMurray First Nation, says Indigenous fire crews rely on their traditional knowledge. The guys have a better sense of, of, of how to go about containing the fire, I think. Uh, you know, it, you put in the effort along the, uh, the perimeters of these fires and a lot of these guys have more experience in the bush than than say maybe you uh, the municipal guys. This wildfire started at the end of April and it ripped through this area burning everything in its sight. And while it may not look it, this fire is still burning underground, sometimes up to three meters deep. Alberta's indigenous communities have been hit hard during the wildfires, both in terms of damage and displacement. For Blaine Potts from Alexis First Nation, this type of work is personal. It does kind of like break my heart knowing that a whole bunch of wildlife is getting burnt up and people are losing their homes, their hunting cabins. That same sentiment spurred Paul to help out. The more guys we have out here, the more we can get people home. Julia Wong, CBC News, near Entwistle, Alberta. These wildfires are being fueled by hot, dry conditions. And on that heat, not just in Canada, but around the world, there's a dire warning tonight. Susan Ormerson explains. Cyclones, like the one wrecking havoc this week in Myanmar, are more intense and blow longer, in part because of climate change, say scientists, as a new warning comes from the World Meteorological Organization. It's practically sure that we will see the warmest year on record during the coming five years. Heat spikes like this spring in Australia are a sign the world's temperature will very likely rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2027, breaching a key warming limit. It's a conclusion that, uh, that, uh, that we haven't been able to, uh, to limit the warming so far and, uh, and we are still moving in the wrong, wrong direction. They're the gold standard for understanding how the Earth is changing. So when they say something, I, I put a lot of weight on it and I believe it. Um, they're telling us that we are about to shatter norms once again since the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, Keep 1.5 Alive has been a global rallying cry. 1.5 degrees is seen as a critical guardrail on warming, now set to fall. We're starting to dangerously flirt with a critical threshold of 1.5 degrees, and that still we are not doing what is needed to reduce emissions, to phase out fossil fuels. Signs of stress are everywhere. Flooding battered northern Italy this week, made more severe because the bone-dry earth can't easily absorb sudden torrential rains. For years, the theory was that if folks had more information, then climate action would uh, become more desirable and we'd start to see more movement at the government level. I think that in 2023, where we're at, is understanding that the crisis we're in is a result of power dynamics. And at the moment, global heat seems to be flexing its power. So Susan, on these predictions, 
What's driving it? Well, lots of things. Many countries are tackling CO2 emissions, but scientists say that the modeling may not be robust enough to keep pace with the warming. And then they're looking at a new influence, and that's El Nino, a weather pattern headed this way this year. It'll make some parts hotter, some parts more wet, but overall it's kind of like a blanket warming effect. And then the predictions don't say we're going to exceed those targets every year in the next five, probably one. But, you know, one expert said these days, every year seems like it was record setting five to ten years ago. No kidding. Susan, thank you. A series of deadly avian flu outbreaks is having a devastating impact on Quebec's poultry industry. Currently, 20 locations are battling the virus. That is the most in any province. Sarah Levitt shows us how farmers are trying to lock down and stop the spread. We, we do our best. Before Frédéric Paris even steps into his barn to see his chickens, he takes off his boots. Inside a vestibule, more procedures. I'm ready to go to work inside the barns. Paris is the only one to go inside. All this to protect the chickens. We take all the possible steps to protect our farm, our birds, our flocks and our livelihood from the virus. That virus is the H5N1 strain of avian flu and Paris has reason to worry. A cluster of poultry farms nearby have lost their entire flocks from the flu and euthanasia after infections were detected. Quebec is grappling with the worst outbreaks it's ever had. There are 20 confirmed infected locations already this year, almost the same as all of last year. There's a lot of virus out in the environment right now. At this McMaster University lab, Matthew Miller concentrates his efforts on prevention through vaccine and antiviral drug development. Since this strain was first detected in Canada in late 2021, 7.6 million birds have either died of the flu or been euthanized. Miller says the economic and agricultural impacts are immense, but he has a bigger concern. When these viruses spill over from animals like chickens or turkeys into humans, it can have very, very high death rates. Human infection is rare, but can happen. This week, two poultry workers in the UK tested positive for the flu. The good news is that these viruses don't spread well from person to person. They mainly infect people who come in close contact with infected animals. In his driveway, Paris sprays a car with disinfectant, a requirement for anybody who drives onto his property. After all, it's his livelihood on the line. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Saint-Cécile de Milton, Quebec. A music icon is pitching a surprising new collaboration. Shout out to the First Nations of Canada. That's right, for joining Nico Sparks in the Ottawa Senator's bid. Snoop Dogg teams up with an Indigenous community. Next. Stunning images of the Titanic show the wreckage like it's never been seen before. You can actually identify people's uh, belongings that are still on the bottom of the ocean. And a sudden attack on a quiet bike path. I just did not expect him to actually come at me, and he did. We're back in two. A major change is expected to be announced tomorrow that will affect well over a million people in Ontario. CBC News has learned Premier Doug Ford intends to break apart Peel region, which is just west of Toronto. Peel currently consists of the cities of Mississauga, Brampton and the town of Caledon. The three share infrastructure, including transit and policing. Mississauga's mayor has been pushing for this, saying the move will save her city money. Now, hundreds of investors are alleging a B.C. mortgage broker stole millions of dollars. As Renee Filipponi tells us, they say they were promised high returns for their investments but were left with nothing when it was time to withdraw. I don't think that I'll ever see my money again. Unless Alia Stimson says she is just one of hundreds of investors in court looking for answers and that she's out $300,000. Due to health reasons at work, uh, I don't qualify for a maternity leave and was looking for uh, alternative ways to kind of support my growing family. She says she invested in a company called My Mortgage Auction Corp, based on Vancouver Island, and that its owner, Greg Martel, promised high returns and said the money was being used for short-term real estate investments. You will 100% get back, pay back. 
But in recent months, people say they couldn't get their money out. More than $200 million allegedly missing. The company placed into receivership. In a recent statement to CBC News, Martel says the company has the ability to enable all investors to recoup their investments and denies it's a Ponzi scheme. The firm overseeing the receivership says the company's financial statements say it had $234 million in assets, but it's only been able to locate one bank account with less than $300. The lawyer for one of the investors says Martel's whereabouts are unknown. There has been a lack of cooperation in the context of uh, providing information to the court, uh, pursuant to court orders, and also providing inf information to investors as to where the money went. It is a classic example of, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. This Vancouver investment advisor has been following the case and says what he has heard is shocking. It's not good enough if their friends are making money and, you know, they want to get in on it. They should really be doing more due diligence before they, they do anything. The judge has now given the receiver power to get more information about what happened to the millions of dollars and given Martel a deadline of May 26th to comply. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Now to a much different investment being watched by a lot of Canadians. Snoop Dogg says his bid to buy the Ottawa Senators now includes First Nations in Canada. Nicole Williams now with the unprecedented proposal that's already got some people excited. Snoop Dogg appeared to break the news on Instagram. A shout out to the First Nations of Canada. That's right for joining Nico Sparks in the Ottawa Senators bid. The rapper didn't say which First Nations he and the LA businessman are working with or how many. But in this quiet area of Western Quebec, Kitigan Zibi and Nishinaabeg could be on the verge of making a deal. Its chief confirmed members met with bidders this week, including the Nico Sparks team. And people here are now starting to dream about the possibilities. Uh, making a statement for First Nations saying that, look, uh, we can get a team on our unseated line. I think it would be a good move for us, honestly. I love Snoop Dogg. <laughs> I love you, Snoop Dogg. <laughs> Though not everyone is so sure. I think the First Nations should stay out of it. The chief of the Algonquins of Pickwocknagon in eastern Ontario says he's interested in any economic opportunities that benefit the community. Other community leaders have reached out themselves, trying to get in on a deal to co-own the team. It's such an exciting process and... Um, could be a very big precedent-setting moment, you know, in terms of uh, this type of relationship across Canada. This professor says this could signal a shift from consulting First Nations to actually getting them involved on big business deals. Never had it crossed my mind before that this would ever be an opportunity where a potential owner would reach out and say, well, with our billion-dollar team here, We'd like to bring the First Nations. It's still unclear exactly what a partnership in owning an NHL team would look like for a First Nation, but some people here say giving Indigenous communities any stake in a major sports franchise is a real step towards reconciliation. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Kitigan ZB. A Newfoundland pharmacist is blowing the whistle on an eye drug he says is being misused. It's incredibly risky behavior. A CBC News investigation uncovers an illegal practice involving a popular prescription drug. Makes me very angry, very upset. And we take a closer look at what makes a wildfire go from risky to destructive. You are not going to put this fire out with a hose. You're going to get out of the way uh, as quickly as you can. And this is overwhelming energy. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. in Newfoundland is sounding the alarm on the tampering of an eye medication and it is happening without patient's knowledge. It's for medication used to treat age-related macular degeneration. That's a condition that affects about two and a half million Canadians. As Chris O'Neill Yates tells us, the misuse of this drug may be putting patients at risk. They've been called magic drugs for aging eyes. What's the drug meant to your life? A lot, because I can see. Helping millions keep their vision with just a small poke. Don't move, you'll feel a little pinch. 
The drugs are supposed to come in sealed vials, directly from the maker. There go. But packages like this have been showing up across the country, setting off alarm bells. It's incredibly risky behavior. It's interfering with a commercial product, which is illegal. Living on Newfoundland's coastline is something Marguerite McCarthy doesn't take for granted. Much more precious since she developed a condition called wet macular degeneration that could take away vistas like this for good. Like I'm looking at you straight on here now and you're a bit blurry, but if I do this, you're clear. McCarthy relies on injections of drugs in her eyes every four to six weeks her only hope to prevent losing her sight. What's, what's there to live for, really? That's the way I feel. Like, I always say, I can't imagine my last leg, but you know something? I think I'd rather lose a leg than lose my sight, because my sight is everything. Wet age-related macular degeneration is a condition where new blood vessels in the back of the eye leak or bleed into the center of the retina, resulting in poor vision. There is no cure. But Lucentis and Ilea are two injectables, seen as miracle drugs, proven to help slow down the condition. These drugs come in sealed vials from the drug company. With a price tag of about $2,000, they are some of the most expensive drugs in the country. The ophthalmologist draws up a tiny drop in a syringe and injects it into the eyeball. It is to be used one time only on one patient per eye. It was just glaring. Ken Dix is a pharmacist in Newfoundland with over 30 years of experience. He helped write the federal government's policy on how to handle and dispense various drugs. Just close your eye for me. Thank you. He had a hunch. After looking into how many injections were being done on patients in the province, the numbers just didn't add up. There were too many procedures and not enough product. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, because you need an injection to do the procedure. So it was easy enough to research how many procedures are being done. And then the question became, where, where are the products to match those procedures? The only explanation, he says, was the vials were being tampered with and split. All vials contain overfill, an extra amount to make sure the right dose can be drawn. The drug manufacturers say any leftover is supposed to be discarded. But it's entirely possible to draw the overfill and create more doses. I'm not in favor of that. I don't dose split personally. Dr. Alan Cruess is an ophthalmologist in Halifax. He performs these procedures daily and says dose split products can be dangerous. Anytime you're drawing from a vial, more than once, you're, you know, there are theoretical microbiological risks involved. Well, bacteria being introduced, um, you know, into the, into the compound and then creating inflammation or infection. We have no idea if these products work. We have no idea now because the product integrity has been breached. <laughs> Documents from 2015 that Dix obtained under access to information backed his suspicions. Citing an aging population and surging demand for these drugs, the provincial government was in search of a cost-cutting deal. A pharmacy in Ontario offered to divide manufacturers' vials of the drugs and ship pre-filled syringes to Newfoundland and Labrador. Then a smoking gun. There were no other markings, no gradients nothing else on the, the syringe whatsoever. Keith Morgan is Dix's lawyer who specializes in pharmaceutical law. A package of ILEA they got their hands on looked nothing like the real thing. It came in a tinted bag with a new expiry date and no brand name label. Morgan and Dix contacted Health Canada to come take the package and test it. They reviewed it, uh, found that it was sterile and destroyed the sample, destroyed the product that we provided to them. What did you make of that? I was flabbergasted that, you know, this was evidence of, of a regular, in my view, it was a regulatory offense. And they took it and they destroyed it. 
CBC News contacted Health Canada about the matter. In an email, it says that due to the healthcare system's pressures, many rely on third parties to make and supply these drugs. It adds that Health Canada is exploring a regulatory framework to oversee outsourcing arrangements. So here's something else. More doses means more money. So who's pocketing that extra cash? Is it doctors, pharmacies, distributors, government? We simply don't know. You know, there's obvious commercial advantages. I mean, you're, you're taking one product and creating four or five um, you know, doses out of that one product. The Newfoundland Pharmacy Board says, well, uh, that's coming from Ontario, it's not our wheelhouse. They have full inspection powers. They could have done that, they could have seen the invoicing. They didn't really look at, they didn't want to look, it appears to be, uh, as to what was the background, what, why was this be happening. The large-scale contract was ultimately called off, but Dix believes dose-split drugs are still flowing into Newfoundland. Provincial officials denied our interview requests. It seems the defunct plan was so secret that to this day, nobody is keen to talk about it. We've gone to the Premier, we've gone to the, the, the Minister provincially, we've gone to the Newfoundland Labrador Pharmacy Board. All of them have said, nothing to see here, folks. I told everybody I could, which is my obligation. I guess hoping that somebody would tidy this up for us. But that never happened. It said everybody went to ground. Everyone went to ground. Emails weren't answered, phone calls weren't returned. Meanwhile, the distribution pattern Dix and Morgan have uncovered could be a blueprint for other provinces. It's not just a Newfoundland issue. This is a national issue. Uh, it's one that we understand has, has, has tentacles all the way across Canada. And that's why for Dix it all comes back to patient safety for all Canadians. I've been at this 32 years and I've gone to work every day trying to do what's in the best interest of my patients. Once you know, you know, you can't unknow and then your obligation is what do you do with it. Marguerite McCarthy, who used to get ILEA injections, is left with a lot of questions. Makes me very angry makes me very angry, very upset. If it's from the hospital, if it's from some pharmacy outside, I have no idea. We're not told any of those things. Well, I don't really ask, but I'm going to start asking a lot more questions now. So Chris, that's really interesting. Anything more you can tell us about Bear's reaction to this practice of dose splitting? When Dix complained, they reissued a directive. This was in 2022, saying that ILEA was not to be dose split. Now, they've begun taking matters into their own hands and issuing single-use syringes of ILEA. And we have also learned that they have filed a $15 million lawsuit against a different Ontario company, alleging that the company was dose splitting ILEA. All right, Chris O'Neill Yates in St. John's, thank you. You're welcome. A little later in the show, the Titanic wreckage reconstructed. To see it without the water uh, was just breathtaking. The extraordinary 3D images that shed more light on what happened. If you're looking at the raging fires in Alberta and thinking, this feels like it's getting worse, you are unfortunately right. The frequency and tenacity of fires in this era is different. Just ask the residents in Lytton, Slave Lake and Fort McMurray. Homes, livelihoods and communities are all gone within a blink of an eye and it's happening again now. So why are they worse? Uh, why are they stronger? Why are they more frequent? John Valiant, who uh, spent years looking at what happened in 2016 in the Fort McMurray fires, is with us now. Thanks for joining us, John. I, I, we pulled up some pictures here because I, I think these are some of the most recent pictures of the wildfires in Alberta. And as a layperson, as I watch it, it looks absolutely terrible, but also almost indistinguishable from other fires. And I'm wondering what you see that's different. Yeah. Um... One fire, you know, one size does not fit all uh, with uh, with wildfires. This is uh, 
what you'd call a rank six wildfire. It's the it's the greatest intensity uh, that uh, the rating scale you know it goes up to. So it's like a, comparable to a category five hurricane. So these flames are probably well over a hundred, well close to a hundred meters tall at their very peak. They're going right up out of the frame, as we can see. Uh, these are entire trees combusting all at once. And what happens with a big boreal fire is a hundred, a thousand of these trees may go up simultaneously, creating this wall of fire that can be a hundred uh, hundred meters tall and releasing energy that is kind of borderline nuclear. Like they're, they're, you, you are not going to put this fire out with a hose. You're not going to put it out with a bucket. You're not going to put it out with an airplane uh, full of retardant. You're going to get out of the way uh, as quickly as you can. And this is overwhelming energy. So why so strong, though? Yeah, it's so strong because really since around 2000, we've seen a change uh, in northern forests, particularly in the boreal forest system, which is a circumpolar uh, forest system that goes all the way around the northern hemisphere. And what we've had is heating and drying, and those go together hand in hand. And with you've got 50% more CO2 in the atmosphere than there was uh, in pre-industrial times. So this is industrial CO2 generated by fossil fuel burning. So you wanted to look in particular at, at a fire tornado. This is the image we have up here right now. These are pretty rare. I know this is from California in 2018. Why do you want to look at this right now in relation to Alberta? I want to look at this in relation to Alberta because this is the future of fire. So the first fire tornado ever recorded, ever seen, ever measured was in Australia in 2003. Everyone then wondered, Will we ever see another one? Well, we saw another one in 2018 in Redding, California. And it was an EF3 tornado. That's um, wind speeds over well over 200 kilometers an hour. The temperatures were uh, sufficient to melt steel. Uh, it just, just blew houses right off their foundations. And it was a level of destruction I've never witnessed in my life. It looked like what you would see after a nuclear blast. Well, looking and, at it right now, it's a little hard mm -hmm. to imagine all the heat that's in that. Think of a Ford F-150 pickup truck driving into it, being thrown up into the air, spun around, smashed into the ground with a person in it, and burnt down to the springs and the chassis. That's all that was left. Now, will we have a fire like this in Alberta? It is possible now. You know, once you've introduced this new reality to nature and to our planet, it's possible. This image here, this is a cast iron skillet. Come Think on. about the energy that it takes to take a cast iron skillet, throw it hundreds of meters from the nearest house, which was blown off its foundation, destroyed and burnt to nothing, to break the handle off the cast iron pan and punch a hole through it. There, there were no tools or weapons involved in this. This was fire energy that did this. And these are not the fires of 30, 40 years ago, is what you're saying? No, no, they are not. When you look at the aftermath, when you look at, at what's left over and the building materials, what is that also new? Are you seeing not just the speed of the fire, but what's burning, t telling you a story? Modern, the modern house is actually filled with petroleum products. You know, think of vinyl siding, think of tar shingles, think of vinyl windows, Think of our carpets, our mattresses, our sofas and chairs. They're all made with synthetics, which are at root petroleum products. And we've got to really remember that petroleum, it's a fossil fuel. The reason why we're generally interested in it is because it burns. And you can also make plastics and synth uh, synthetics out of it, but those will volatize and burn much more intensely than cotton or wool or wood. And so you have a modern house now that may have a wooden frame, but many of the other components are actually petroleum products. And when you get a house like that hot enough, like it was in Lytton, like the houses were in Fort McMurray, they, will, they won't just catch on fire, they will explode into flame. And so you had houses in Lytton and also in Fort McMurray burning to the ground, to the basement, 
in five minutes. One last thought as you as you look at this fire here and and know what people in Alberta uh, are looking at and going through. What thoughts do you have for them right now? I feel fear and real sympathy. These are traumatizing events that sear uh, the experience into your memory. And you can never quite look at a forest or your own neighborhood the same way again, because now you know what's possible. John Valiant, thank you. Thanks for having me on. So something else Valiant noted, if you consider the homes your grandparents lived in, in a comparison, they would burn much more slowly than modern homes. They were built from and furnished with often different, more natural materials, which is something he says we really need to think about right now. Next, the geese are back, and so are the surprise attacks. So like within two flaps, this thing the size of a watermelon was coming straight at me. How a New Brunswick man survived to tell the tale in our moment. You are about to get an unprecedented view of the world's most famous shipwreck. Stunning new 3D images show what is left of the Titanic on the ocean floor. And as Chris Brown shows us, it's shedding new light on what happened during that maiden voyage. It's as if the Titanic has had all of the water surrounding it 3,800 meters under the Atlantic drained away. This stunning 3D reconstruction is made up of 700,000 images. Deep sea mapping company Magellan and Atlantic Productions captured the images for a documentary. We have an absolute replica, bolt by bolt, of the Titanic. And we can look at it at full size, we can look at it at, you know, at smaller sizes. There are new and incredible details, such as the serial number on a propeller. This debris field, rather than just being a collection of shoes and champagne bottles and other things, you can actually identify people, people's uh, belongings that are still on the bottom of the ocean. I'm the king of the world! What most people know of the Titanic, about how a ship built to be unsinkable, hit an iceberg and sank on its maiden voyage comes from James Cameron's 1997 blockbuster. Cameron got a lot correct about what happened that night, but the new images also suggest new storylines. Well, Officer Murdoch in the Jim Cameron movie is a bad guy who doesn't seem to want to launch the last the lifeboat. Well, we went down and we could look at the exact David that was holding the boat back. So in fact, he couldn't have launched it because it was jammed. To see it without the water, uh, was just breathtaking. Physician, scientist and explorer Joe McInnes was the first Canadian to dive the wreck. You're looking through a tiny viewport and you see this tiny section of seafloor or the Titanic and you don't have a sense of the, of the, the size of everything. So today's images kind of broke that for me to, to see it in a way that, that I could only imagine. McKinnis says as more stories about the Titanic are revealed, the more we learn about ourselves, which is why the story of the sinking continues to fascinate. How would I react if I was on the Titanic? Uh, would I be courageous? Would I be a coward? It's a provocative place and it's a provocative subject. With microbes eating away at the steel, every year the ocean swallows up more of the wreck. But now with these new images, it's as if the Titanic has been preserved for generations to study and learn from. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Preparations are underway in New Brunswick to welcome Princess Anne. She is expected to arrive tomorrow. The Princess Royal is visiting for several days to celebrate the 175th anniversary of the 8th Canadian Hussars. They are Canada's oldest continuously serving armoured regiment and is her colonel-in-chief. This will be her first visit to Canada since 2018. And when Princess Anne visits New Brunswick, she may want to keep an eye out for this guy, a vicious Canadian goose, which, as you can see, flew at a cyclist this past weekend. So luckily, Eric Jingles of Moncton survived the attack with a few scrapes and bruises and, of course, a story to tell. The foul encounter is our moment. I uh, survived an attack from a cobra chicken. I was out for a bike ride Sunday evening. There was uh, a family of geese. 
the big one at the end started to like hiss and I thought oh isn't that adorable and then all of a sudden it launched so like within two flaps this thing the size of a watermelon was coming straight at me I'm like oh my gosh like is that really happening and also I was kind of turning this way my phone was all I had in between me and it so I was kind of using my phone to try to smack it out of the way it was on me and I try to push it off I thought I gave them like lots of room and like I said, I was really surprised that he just launched. He was uh, ready to rumble. I just did not expect him to actually come at me, and he did. <laughs> I was able to stay on my bicycle and keep riding. The cautionary tale is just give them lots of room. Okay, bruised him, cut the skin. Before you say that goose is a jerk, there were goslings nearby just trying to be a proud parent. That is a national for May the 17th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.